Welcome to your analysis of Cadenza by Ted Hughes. Ted Hughes is greatly occupied with a landscape which is of autobiographical importance. The landscape in Hughes's poetry is extremely violent, irrational and pessimistic in opposition to the harness and tamed landscape of movement poetry which was quite popular during the time. Owing to postmodern ideologies, Hughes deals with the life of instinct and blood or the predatory energies of the natural world. That's going to become very important for us as we analyse Cadenza. Hughes associates predatory energies with the will to live. I shall mention the will to live in a moment. His main concern is to bring about a reconciliation between the human and the non-human world. The poetry Hughes wrote suggests that man should identify with his own predatory energies, which endow him with a life force to face the violent but vital forces of the universe. In other words, Hughes's poetry often deals with life in the presence of the destructive forces of nature. As mentioned on the previous slide, the will to live. The will to live is a psychological force to fight for survival, seen as an important and active process of conscious and unconscious reasoning. This occurs particularly when one's own life is threatened by a serious injury or disease. The idea in which someone who is on the threshold of death may consciously or unconsciously try to stay alive through the belief that they have a reason or something to live for. Again, that's going to become important as we analyse Cadenza. What is the poem about? The poem presents a violinist who is caught in extremely violent surroundings. In Hughes's poetry, violence is a result of the struggle between the contradictory forces of life and death, creation and destruction. This is presented in this poem by powerful images. If we just look at the title in a little bit more detail, Cadenza is perhaps Hughes's most lyrical poem. And the meaning is that it's an improvised or written out ornamental passage played, so it's a piece of music, or sung by a soloist, or soloists, usually in a free rhythmic style. Okay? So it's it's related to music here, so we must use that in our analysis. Cadenza is usually over a final or penultimate note in a piece and accompanies the rest of the notes. Okay, so it usually, as you see there, is over a final or penultimate note in a piece. At the, at the very end, at, um of the piece of music. Again, we will discuss that in more detail as we go. This poem is his most lyrical. The images that we read and are confronted with are those of death, terror, lost love and mourning. Now, these, that's important because the poem then makes for an elegy to Sylvia Plath. Sylvia Plath was Ted Hughes's wife, very famous poet as well. So it's almost in memorial of her. The poem echoes and summons up the tone, pitch and voice of Sylvia Plath's poetry, especially the poem Ariel. Okay, so it's really important that we understand that this lyrical piece of music also acts as an elegy to Sylvia Plath. Her resilience and her suicidal death echo in many of the lines. So make sure we understand that as well. If we begin with structure, the poem uses free verse and that represents the music associated with the title, i.e. the reference to something being improvised and this free rhythmic style that the title refers to. I suppose you can argue as well it is the isolation of Ted Hughes from his beloved Sylvia Plath which is linked to the next the next thing I'm going to say. Now, the poem begins with a single line, a single line stanza, and that embodies his loneliness and his isolation as a solo violinist. Also, his futility in the face of his surroundings, that in the face of nature and the power of nature, he feels worthless. He feels quite weak, doesn't he, at points. 
But as I mentioned just a few seconds ago, it's his isolation away from his his wife, Sylvia Platt, who committed suicide. After your single line stanza to begin, we then get two line stanzas which follow. And that is a couple of things. It is the fight between mankind and nature, which is one of his big themes, isn't it? It is also the struggle between the conscious and unconscious efforts to survive, i.e. what I referred to earlier as the will to live. And it is also the contradictory forces of life and death. There's, there's quite a few reasons there why you've got two lines, two lines, two lines. And don't forget as well, it is his elegy to Sylvia Plath and their, potentially their relationship as a couple. There is the occasional use of enjambment throughout the poem as well. It's not all the time, it's just occasional and that is twofold. It is the build-up of this musical piece. There's a build-up and a build-up until we get the explosion at the end. But it's also the power of nature, which strengthen, strengthens and strengthens until we reach the climax, as I see a huge explosion. And we have uh, the occasional use of the shazera as well, especially on the last line. Shazera is a pause in the middle of a poetic line, so a full stop or a comma or anything. And the shazera on the last line allows the explosion to be more dramatic as the music ends. This explosion of the fight between him and nature, the uh, the fight between the conscious and the unconscious, and to a certain degree, I suppose, the ending of his relationship with Sylvia Plath. If we just analyse a few lines at a time. So we've got the violinist's shadow vanishes, the husk of a grasshopper sucks a remote cyclone and rises, the full bed throat of a woman walking water, the loaded estuary of the dead, and I am the cargo of a coffin attended by swallows. So, the poem begins with a description of the condition of the violinist in the face of violence. The repeated V sound emphasises his futility in the face of nature, and the idea that he vanishes implies he is insignificant in comparison to his surroundings. The image of the husk of a grasshopper which sucks a remote cyclone and rises is a metaphor. It manifests the will to live or the life force which is needed to survive in the face of the creative and destructive energies around it. So here the grasshopper has obviously chosen to survive and therefore we get this over-exaggerated image that it sucks up the cyclone. The power of nature is expressed here through the disparity between the grasshopper and, and this cyclone because obviously a cyclone realistically would demolish the grasshopper, wouldn't it? And we see the fight between creation and destruction and life versus death here. And also the violinist in line one begins and ends the entire poem because remember we we must remember throughout that this is a reference to a piece of music. Another image is that of a female character who is highlighted through the use of alliteration, the full bed throat of a woman walking water, personification, the loaded estuary of the dead. I've got more on the next slide about this, but the alliteration of the W presents a struggle. The struggle of the estuary being full of dead. And is it that nature outlasts people or are his surroundings ferocious in this awful image of this estuary full of the dead. As I say, I'm going to go into more detail on the next slide about that. We also get a metaphor. I am the cargo of a coffin attended by swallows. Hughes accepts that his life is fleeting and as cargo, he would be unloaded and the cargo of a coffin implies death. And if you are cargo and you can be unloaded very easy, there is a reference to how weak mankind is in the face of nature and this fight that they're having. It seems like he's going to lose. Also, though, this coffin image does suggest that nature outpowers and outlasts mankind. But again, we've got to ask ourselves, is it a reference to Sylvia Plath? Because... The, the coffin image was going to change as the poem progresses. So initially he's the cargo in the coffin, but that changes. Is it then her who becomes 
the body in the coffin. More detail about that. So, as I say, we get the image of this female character, which is highlighted through alliteration. I've put your quotations in red here. The poem presents a similarity between the full bared throat of a woman and the tidal mouth of the river, which is loaded with the dead. The woman is a reflection of the white goddess. I've got more about that on the next slide. Who is as furious as the loaded estuary of the dead. The throat and the estuary stand for the instinct of hunger, which is an expression of the will to live. The goddess manifests herself through the furious instinct of hunger and the will to live, as I say. So we've got this image of a goddess. Again, you have to think about interpretation there. Is it just this white goddess that I'm going to tell you about in a second? Or is it loosely based on Sylvia Plath? Hughes not only accepts the reality of a will-driven predatory world, but adopts a positive attitude towards it by associating it with vigour and vitality. The vitality is caught in the midst of death, destruction, war and violence. And when I say positive here, I mean that, you know, he is willing to fight, isn't he? Fight for survival. The will to live is a key theme here. And we get words like suck, swallows and mouth, which are used in the poem to reinforce, as I say, hunger. The violinist who deliberately ignores this does not dare to confront the threatened and vital forces of nature. Blue with sweat, the violinist crashes into the orchestra, which explodes. So again, we get this isolated image of the violinist against this ferocious backdrop and the surroundings. Some additional information about the White Goddess. So the White Goddess, a historical grammar of poetic myth, is a book-length essay on the nature of poetic myth-making. The book is based on earlier articles, published 1948, 1952 and 1961, and they were revised. Now, the White Goddess is an approach to the study of mythology. The author and poet Robert Graves proposes this existence of a European goddess, the White Goddess of birth, love and death much similar to the mother goddess inspired and represented by the phases of the moon. Now, throughout, Robert Graves argues that true poetry is linked with ancient ritual, the ancient ritual of the white goddess and her son. And ultimately, the book suggests that there's one single goddess with her son and that every religion in the world that has any form of goddess is from this goddess. So in making this claim, sorry, I've missed the bottom bit off there. In making this claim, we have almost an idea of feminism here. Apologies, I've missed that off the bottom. There's, there's a, an idea or a, or a link to feminism if you've got this one goddess who has influenced every religion in the world. Again, this is your interpretation about this white goddess and this link this mythical link, um, is it related to the music? Is it related to his marriage? If we return back to the poem, we get, and I am the water, bearing the coffin, which will not be silent. The clouds are full of surgeries and collisions, but the coffin escapes as a black diamond. So the violinist at the end of the poem sweats when he is exposed to the water which carries the coffin and the outrageous clouds, the sea which swallows wings and flings and a bat with a ghost in its mouth. The poet reveals a grasshopper which is better adjusted to its violent surroundings. The metaphorical force of language and the hyperbole expresses an over-exaggerated struggle that rings true. So you've got, as I say, that's quite a lot I've put in that bit there, but all of these images and all of these references are over-exaggerated, but to some degree, there, there is a reality to them. Fight for survival. That is a reality. Yes, I know Ted Hughes goes over the top with his images, but essentially that is what he's referring to, to, to um, the will to live. We get the metaphor, obviously, and I am the water bearing the coffin, which will not be silent. Now, a moment ago, he was the cargo on the coffin, and now he's the water surrounding it. So again, as I, see, as I said, you've got that, that loose reference to Sylvia Plath. But also, 
It's the reconciliation between the human and the non-human world as he becomes the water. And that is what a lot of his poems strive to do, make that link. It's like he's at one with nature. And then we have this peaceful adjective of silent. And then we get another metaphor. The clouds are full of surgeries and collisions. Again, look, surgeries. Trying to stay alive. Trying to survive. Trying to repair yourself or heal yourself. And then collisions. There's a, there's a really tight link here between human nature and nature. Because the clouds are almost fighting to survive in that image. And this this reference at the coffin escapes as a black diamond. Is it that life is precious and that's why it's a diamond? Is that what he's saying here? But remember the colour black has ominous connotations. It has connotations of death. And this diamond becomes a ruby, a ruby brimming blood. Look at that personification and we've got the juxtaposition the value of existence and the fragility of it. So a ruby suggests something valuable, but then something brimming with blood suggests it's injured, it's fragile. It's Sorry, it's fragile. And we've got the harsh consonant sounds and the plosive B, and it really does explode out of your mouth. And we've got a simile as well here. The whole sky dives shut like a burned land back to its spark. Like a burned and back again, the plosive B sounds. It, this is all leading into the massive explosion at the end of the poem. It's sound imagery to link to this lyrical idea we've got going through. And the sky seems to react in an evil way by shutting out the sea and shutting out other things. Is nature then shutting out mankind? Is that a link to the Garden of Eden? When um, Adam and Eve were thrown out of heaven? Possibly. And then the end. A bat with a ghost in its mouth, struck up by lightnings of silence, blue with sweat, the violinist crashes into the orchestra, which explodes. I've mentioned sweat again there because I know I did mention it earlier, so it's on this slide as well. That the violinist sweats when he's exposed to the water which carries the coffin. So perhaps the violinist at the end begins to panic. Um... And we return to the musical theme of the violinist at the end here, a soloist. Perhaps this is a reminder of his loneliness, that he's isolated. Explodes at the end of the poem. Notice that that is how we finish the poem. I did mention earlier that you have your shazura here, which is your comma, which allows the explosion to really ring, ring out loudly and be on its own for prominence. And the explosion is the crescendo of music as it comes to the end, you know, like the, the highest moment, and the collision. And it is the collision of predatory instinct and the natural world, as if, they, as, as if they've collided. Okay, the predatory instinct and the natural world, the fight for survival versus nature, which we've had throughout the poem, haven't we? And as I said at the beginning, throughout the poem, we have this link between the conscious and the unconscious trying to fight, trying to stay alive. And in the face of all this, Ted Hughes uses the natural world and what we realise is how powerful the natural world is and that, for the most part, it will outlast us. All the way through, we have the presence of dis the destructive forces of nature, even the grasshopper, which is exaggerated. But again, that's what he's showing us. And remember, his concern here is the reconciliation between the human and the non-human world, which is why we have these bizarre images all intertwined. We must also remember that the poem acts as an elegy to Sylvia Plath. And as I said at the beginning, it echoes her tone, her pitch, her voice from some of her poetry. The musical theme is throughout. We've got this idea that not only is a poem that is an elegy to her, but perhaps a piece of music as well. Something quite lyrical, something very fanciful, because the images aren't real, are they? 
look, a lot of the images there are over exaggerated. I hope this has been useful. If you do need any more of my poetry videos, just check out my YouTube channel, which is Stacey Ray, S-T-A-C-E-Y, and Ray is R-E-A-Y.